Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and once again, I'm joined by Stevie Mullen and Jim Simonetti. Welcome back, guys. Thanks for having us, Paul. Yeah. How are you? I'm very well, Jim, because obviously last night we got back to uh, what we do best. We're playing football and scoring goals and winning games. Uh, first and foremost, Steve, I think you predicted 6 1 when you won last one, week. Yep. Uh, how impressed were you last night? I was very impressed. Last week when we played against Kilmarnock, and it wasn't a point of view that I agreed with when yourself and some of the other pundits had said, you know, about we need to give all the respect and credit to Kilmarnock. Well, I totally disagreed with that. I would never give them anything for just narrowing the part anti-football. So when they came last night, same sort of football, we destroyed them. I think Celtic should take all the plaudits for last night. I'm not going to listen to this or they weren't very good. We said the exact same thing against Copenhagen. Remember raving about them last week against Manchester United. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. How impressed were you with the, the channels? It's something we couldn't do at Rugby Park, but we used the word expertly, didn't we? I thought the two fullbacks moved up very early, which gave us the bout, the ball. I thought the passing was crisper and faster last night. And then the fullbacks were coming off the touchline, as you've shown with Taylor, you know, more than even Mohammed. And I thought it worked great, and that gave more space to Ellen Nussi and James Forrest White. Yeah, I thought, it, I thought it was did. very, very good. It was. And I mean, you're talking about the passing. I was so impressed with Julian. He was just getting that ball and spraying it all over the pitch. No more so than the, the opening goal for El Yunusi. What a pass, Stevie. Half line into the penalty box. Great first touch by El Yunusi. Brown the goalkeeper with the first touch and then pressure's off and that was it after that. The only wee bit, and again, you've, you've always got, as a Celtic fan, you've always got for the wee bit that disappointed you. I thought a few times we were caught over the he- Beton's head for going through. So there's still a wee bit what in this air. In the second half, I'm a stickler for doing things correctly. And if you get good habits, it's the same as bad habits, they'll become your habit. And I thought we started showboating a wee bit in the second half, where we'd have kept playing away, I thought we'd have hit double figures last night. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, there's when when you're looking at um, the questions that were being asked of Scott Brown prior to the game about morale, there's nothing better than going out and winning by a big scoreline and scoring goals, Jim. You're in the game yourself Uh at a youth level. Um, and it's all about enjoying and expressing yourself. I got the, the, the impression last night the Celtic play was just free-flowing. It was, but before we go into that, uh, you're right, it's about expressing myself. I'm, I'm actually quite pleased that uh, Stevie's expressed to us as being pundits, because uh, he's got a bit of uh, notoriety in the continent, uh, with the Spanish and the Portuguese, so you're a bit of a, a pundit. So well done for that. Uh, have we got the fan mail uh, bag there? Because there's, there's quite a bit run about the place for them. So well done for that. But isn't it great that uh, people uh, are looking in from the continent uh, and looking at the comments that's been made in the show? If uh, everybody that comes on, I think it's great. But uh, back to the game last night. Uh, Paul, yep, free flowing. Uh, Big Julian, no problem. Edward, no problem. Actually, round about the whole, whole of the park. I thought we looked a, a pretty pretty relaxed all round and it looked like a, a relaxed game. We spoke about it yesterday, uh, so that's our seventh seventh uh, Icelandic game over, over the years and uh, won very comfortably. I don't think we were ever, ever under any danger, any pressure or whatever, which sometimes in, in these games... Uh, you would like to be under a wee bit of pressure when you're ahead to see how the different reaction goes. But overall, well done. Well Impressive. done, Celtic. Impressive. We'll run through some of the uh, points that we've taken away from the game, Jim and Stevie. Uh, one of the big points is on Oliver and Cham. Stevie, you've, you've made a great uh, point yourself. You've raised that we can't say that we're playing bad opposition. You've just got to look at the performance. And although and Cham wasn't on the field for a great length of time, he was extremely impressive. So the question I'm asking is, should he start against Dundee United? I mean, that's two games in a row that Scott Browns came off and he's been replaced by Incham. He was showboating last night. I mean, the, he uh, had been showboating before e- Edward went on a mazy run to score his incredible individual goal. So I'm putting that question out there and we'll have a look at Facebook, Twitter and YouTube to see what the audience think. And uh, Incham, there's no doubt in the boy's ability should he actually start against London United is a big question. Uh, we'll also be looking at Tommy Rogic. Does he have a future at Celtic? There's a story breaking as we speak of a £4 million move to Qatar. Mm-hmm. Um, Eduard, when you look at what that boy is capable of, 
you've got to do everything in your power to keep him, I would suggest. Julien, I've put in here, return to form. Was he really off form? A couple of bad errors maybe against Kilmarnock, but he was class last night. And then a guy that I know you've got a lot of respect for, Stevie, El Hamid, coolest player on the pitch last night. Um, and then finally, Beaton. That was a big surprise when he was uh, announced at centre half. So it raises the question are we still yeah. looking for a replacement centre half? Perhaps Shane Duffy. But we'll also talk about Aaron Hickey because I think, Jim, you've been looking at that situation very closely. Um, and there's a few other things to cover on the show. So let's have a look at some of the comments coming in from YouTube, Facebook, and uh, also Twitter. Stephen T via YouTube reckons that 100% yes. Encham needs to start against Dundee United. Um, he goes on to say we shouldn't even be having this debate. What do you think of that, Stevie? Do you think it's as simple as, right, Scott Brown, you drop out and we bring in Encham? I don't think it's that simple. I think, firstly, Scott Brown has now represented more more appearances for Celtic in Europe than anybody else. So what an accolade for that man. So we can never discard you know, his contribution. But when you talk about guys in space... And Sham creates space because he's so good. You know, when Scott's got the ball, sometimes I looked at him, he's a wee bit hurried. You know, guys are closing him. And Sham creates space. And because he's so good, the opposition back off because they don't want to be made embarrassed. If you've got that ability, then you should be playing for Celtic. You know, if you can dictate the tempo of a game, you know, which will go slow and then you burst in. You know, the greatest player I think I've ever seen been able to do it was Redondo for Real Madrid. Tiago Alcantara can do it for Bayern Munich. Looks as if he's going to be moving. We have something like that in our midst. So, Neil Lennon's been very brave and loyal, sticking to his trusted formation to keep in Cham out. But how long do you keep him out before he gets frustrated? If it was me, I would find a place for him. Mm-hmm. Jim, what's your thoughts? Because, as, as Stevie rightly says, Neil Lennon has had a, a very firm kind of um, backbone to his team and he's, yeah. and he's loyal to them and quite rightly so because they've done a great job but when you see in Cham coming on last night and um, he bossed it didn't he and the guy we've called him the best technician in Scottish football on his day but he needs games because at his age without the games he's going to become unhappy unsettled and he might move on he's already made uh, kind of his mouth go last pre-season about you know not getting a game he wants to leave Celtic aye I think he's uh, he's probably the best, or he's in the top three best players at Celtic. Should he be? Should he be playing for the start? I would have him playing. I'd have him playing. But again, we we with Stevie's comments, we've still got to be. Uh, we've still got to look at Scott Brown, but we can be. We can be. Uh, selective in how we play him because uh, uh, he's a captain of the club he's a captain of the team and with everything that he's done for us but this is an important year so if a player is showing uh, great great strength at training and he's shown it when he gets a chance to come on the park and play then you've got to play him You've got to play them. You've got to look at starting them. Well, we'll see what happens this weekend, but uh, the comments are coming through thick and fast on our social media channels, Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. If you're on the YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe to that. And a big thank you to JBMs, who are the Axon Bulletin sponsor this week. If you wish to get involved in sponsoring a Celtic State of Mind, get in touch and we'll discuss the opportunities. Now, Stephen T states via YouTube, that Encham doesn't run about mad like Ryan Christie, but offers composure, vision and technique. He certainly has technique, Stevie, when you look at the way that um, he just glides past players. And as I say, he was showboating last night. I don't think it's necessarily even Scott Brown who would have to drop out. I think now we've got that many options. Mm. And again, please don't anybody take us the wrong way and it's jumping on the bandwagon. But Ryan Christie, if Neil Lennon decided, can play wide you know, as an alternative to James Forrest, yeah. if he wants the legs in the team. And again, it was something else I said the other day, the stats for Ryan Christie playing out wide was higher than his midfield positions last year. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's not necessarily Scott Brown who has to drop out. That's a good point uh, because, you know, a lot of people don't realise when Christie was playing out left that he was very effective. We had some stats on, on Ryan Christie's performances from Alan Morrison 
who who does the stats for a Celtic state of mind, and he reckoned that was his best position last season. So very interesting. Well, we had him. We actually had him playing wide, and that's that's why I was thinking about the answer uh, regarding Chalmers. I was, I was going through the team in my head and saying, well, we could leave him out. We could leave him out. We could bring the Chalmers for him, or we could have him on the part at the beginning and swap Christie or swap Forrest or uh, any other player in there. Doesn't ne- he, he, Steve is right, doesn't necessarily need to be Scott Brown, but he just came to the, the forefront of my head and my thinking there when I was going to run the full team. But what we've got there, which is a great point as well, we've got a variety to change from and we can adapt accordingly to whatever game we're playing or whom we're playing against. So that's it's everybody is now fighting for a position there. Mm-hmm. There was a great point made last night before the game. When they're interviewing John Hartson and Gordon Strachan. Yeah. You know Gordon Strachan is not my favourite Celtic manager. Oh, we know that. But he made a great point. They were asking him when they announced the team, what do you think the formation will be? So Hartson is going four four two, four four, one one, all the different things. And Strachan went, just give me good players and I'll get you a winning team. I thought, wow, that's quite a, an answer. Mm-hmm. So he wasn't pigeonholing anybody. Just play. And then the way he waxed on about Callum McGregor and his appetite to learn. He says, normally he says, if I would be talking to a centre forward, the other guys turn off and just start doing something. He says, Callum McGregor listened when every position was getting spoken to. So he's just soaking up all that knowledge and it's made the complete player he is. And I thought, that's really, really interesting. You're right, and he became a sponge. He's a, he's a sponge of knowledge. He wants to know about the whole game, and, and a player like McGregor, how what he, he what, what he's he got in his bag as well. He wants to know how how a striker how a striker attacks, how a striker defends, how a midfield player attacks, how a midfield player defends, and how defenders defend and how defenders attack. So he Gordon Strachan was was very good with that point last night. And uh, I liked it as well. And uh, McGregor, that's the kind of a, a guy that you're looking for in the future, hopefully to become a captain. But the other point he made as well, Jim, you know, even about a Yeti, when he was saying, if he plays, he says, it gives you that option if Edward's not playing. He says, he'll know how to play every f- formation as a centre forward. Yeah. He says, if you're bringing your way guys in to play through the middle, he says they're playing like a white guy playing through the middle. Oh, yeah. A Yeti will be able to play as a centre forward and whether it's a 4-4-2, 4-5-1, he can play that game. He's, so it was interesting his wee insight, you know, to different positions being able to play that position. Mm-hmm. I think it's also interesting that, you know, with, with players being interested in other positions, Steve, it, it worked wonders for Jock Steen because he would move players around the park. One such example being Andy Lynch, who was a left winger who became a left back. Yeah. But, you know, Bobby uh, Bobby Murdoch was moved position. Kenny Dalglish was playing midfield for years in the Celtic reserves, and it's not the position he became known for. Danny McGrain used to play right half for the Celtic reserves, and the thinking behind it was you get to know another way of playing, and so you can combat it. So if you're a left winger, you know how to play against a fullback. So if you're a fullback, you know all the tricks. Absolutely. Of the so if Jock Steen done it. Good enough for me, Stevie. Yeah. Um, interesting point being made by Jed Sweeney via YouTube. I'm going to throw this one out to yourself, Stevie, initially. Roderick off just four days after we scouted Turnbull. Now, Turnbull's name's coming up time and time again. We almost signed him. He was pictured in the hoops in the boardroom, and we all know what happened. And it's, I'm delighted that he's back. He's back playing again. Do you think there's legs in the fact that uh, he's been linked to Celtic? And if so... Should we act to avoid another scenario like the John McGinn situation? Well, I watch, Jed, Jed always puts in good points, even if, he, if I'm watching the TV, he's always putting good things in. I spoke to somebody very close to that deal this morning. Celtic, Stoke and Newcastle are all interested in the boy. I spoke to somebody at Celtic yesterday. Talks have taken place with a variety of players and it looks as if something will be done. A lot is dependent on the European progress. If they go, then these guys will be signing. I couldn't say if specifically if Turnbull's won. There's definitely an interest in Gavin Strachan scouted them at the weekend. Right, interesting. We've spoken about Turnbull already, Jim. Yeah. 
my biggest concern is uh, missing out. Now, I'm going to use a couple of examples. We missed out on Fletcher when he would have been a good signing. Yeah. Not this pre-season. Back in 2009. James McCarthy being another yeah. one. And John McGinn. We don't want to do it again with this kid. No, we don't. Uh, and again, uh, we want to get in uh, as fast as we can. But uh, we don't want to just go in and bring them in for the sake of bringing them in because they're on everybody's lips or on other teams' radars. Uh, I like that if a statement as well, that if we if we do well in Europe, then other players will come come along. Um, but I still would like to see uh, players in just now for the league, knowing that just necessarily if we're going into Europe, they want to come, but they want to be uh, part of uh, the team that's going to be looking to go for the 10th, uh, championship in a row Well you've made it clear That's your priority This that's season priority, Jim um, And I, I, there's a lot of people Who would agree with that And that's for sure Glasgow Rebel Good afternoon And good afternoon to you You're commenting via YouTube If anyone is watching The Axon Bulletin On YouTube today Make sure that you subscribe Everything we do is Absolutely free of charge And from Facebook Yes 100% uh, Midfield had a fresh injection Of pace, power and creativity last night when he came on. So there's a lot of support for the notion that uh, Incham should start the game against Dundee United. Uh, Glasgow Rebel then comments that Rogic is leaving, sorry, Rogic leaving is going to hurt like Lustig. I get what he's saying, right, because he is, he's a fan's favourite. He's given us some fantastic memories, Stevie. But it, we, we spoke about Tommy Rogic last night. He was on the bench, which I was, I was happy at. But he's not been utilised, he's not been brought on. And the question was asked, is it time for him to go? Is it time for Roderick to go? And then this morning you wake up and there's apparently a £4 million move in the works. Um, I'm disappointed that we're only getting £4 million for him because a year ago, they're probably looking at double that. Absolutely. Uh, but looking at the squad, looking at some of the other players that we're linked with, who we've already discussed today, is it time for Tommy Roderick to move on? In my opinion, yes. I think we've had the best of Tom Rodgers in a Celtic jersey. Obviously, the manager isn't he going to play him as regular as Tom Rodgers would like. The fact that he's not even sort of getting on the park for any minutes, I think his time's up and it's time to move on and look for somebody fresher. If we're going to try and play with more power and pace, which I would like to see, i.e. a couple of years ago when we played Moodsh and Gladbach, then Tom Rodgers doesn't fit into that model. Unfortunately for Tom Rogic. Everything slows down with Tommy, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean he's got the twinkle toes, he he's can score him, some incredible goals. But the point I would make is, you know, since Neil Lennon's come in, he's hardly been utilised. And he didn't get many games first time round under Lennon either. No, he didn't he? But uh, when you look at him, he's 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 come off the bench, he's been an impact player, he's he's helped us uh, achieve uh in games when he uh, we were behind, he got us in front, he's been a good servant, so if he, if the, the, uh, the news is correct, and he's off to, is it Qatar? Yeah. And, uh, good good luck to him, but I think uh, it's probably time, I'd like to have seen him stay, uh, and be part of the, the squad, but if that is a decision, and he's away, well done he, he, Tom Rogic for everything you've done for Celtic, and, and good luck, uh, if your deal goes through. Yeah, absolutely. There's a few other points to discuss, but let's break mm. away for some uh, transfer discussion, Jim. After yeah. yesterday, you had a closer look at uh, Aaron Hickey. Uh, so what, what's your view on whether or not that deal is dead? Well, I, 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 I did we think yesterday uh, about Aaron Hickey, um, who's a 2002 age group player, which is an age group that we that I had a personal uh, input uh, with, uh, with uh, Jimmy Johnson and uh, Academy, we played a lot of 2002 teams, various teams, and taking in games when Aaron was playing uh, for for Hearts, uh, watching it, I liked him, I liked him, then I, I, I got him picked out, and I was told who he was, and then when he came over to Celtic uh, Youth Academy, I watched him there as well, because we had the guy, the Jimmy Johnston Academy guys up there training as well and working on because they got to the semi-final of the Scottish Cup and um, uh, I watched them the 2002s playing there at times I thought he, he might have been a wee bit weak but then the more I watched him I liked his technique um, he uh, 
And then when I seen him coming on the Scottish Cup 2019 final, uh, I think he was the, the youngest player uh, to appear in a Scottish Cup final. Uh, and now you've got Bayern Munich, you've got Lyon, you've got Aston Villa, and there was Man City in the, the fold there as well, and Bologna. Mm. So uh, I think this young guy is worth investing in for a Celtic point of view. All right? I think he's really, really worth it. So, uh, Bologna were expecting an answer from him uh, in August of 17, and he never, he never gave them a, an answer. Uh, he would like to play for Celtic, uh, I'm sure. Uh, but he's been probably been offered a handsome package as well uh, to go elsewhere. But I think uh, a young player like that at 18, uh, could really make an impact at Celtic this year. Actually, it reminds me about um, uh, Alfonso Davis, yeah, who's the left back stroke winger at Bayern Munich. He's nineteen. He's a two thousand and one. These are age groups, Paul, that that we take interest in. Yes. When you when you work with the kids, you know the age groups, and you look out there and you see what's out there to help your team develop and show them that's where they can can get to. So these players run about these ages. Uh, we know uh, so Alfonso Davis uh, uh, is a fantastic player for, for Bayern Munich and if you go back a few years as well Liam Morrison uh, he he's uh, another young player that was at Celtic that went to Bayern he decided that he didn't want to sign for Celtic he wanted to go to Bayern so it's turning out that he's actually playing a bit now he looks like uh, Mats Hummels who's won three titles with Bayern as a centre back so I think what I'm saying is that I would like Celtic uh, to push a wee bit harder uh, for Aaron and let's see if we can get him uh, for for, uh, for a, a, a short term or even a longer term contract and let's let's help him progress the way Kieran Tierney done at uh, the left back position and I think he's worth worth having uh, an investment in. So I would like to see Aaron Hickey definitely 100% at Celtic. It's another thing where you're looking at the Rogic deal, Stevie. They're talking £4 million pounds plus Rogic's wages, which I'm pretty sure are probably in the higher echelons of the, the wage bracket because yeah. he was so lauded by Brennan Rogers. You take that player out of the squad... And you can reinvest in some of the youngsters that we're talking about. And they're not project buys. You know, Turnbull would be pushing for a, a, a spot in the Celtic team. Hickey would be second choice to Taylor, of course, yeah. uh, initially. Uh, but then obviously you'd be looking at him as backup because, you know, even last night I thought Taylor looked as though he was injured, you know. And that he's, we're one injury away from not having a left back. And, uh, you know, I still wouldn't play Callum McGregor there like no. some folk would, Stevie. No. But, you know, you'd look at someone like Roger who's actually contributing nothing at the moment and hasn't contributed for some time, you could reinvest your Rogic money in a couple of players like that. But it, it also begs the question about the centre half. Now, the biggest surprise for me last night was Nia Beaton starting. Didn't have a mm -hmm. bad game, Stevie. Wasn't a standout, I don't think. It's the go-to option for Neil Lennon, though. He's a dependable player that Lennon really relies on at times. But I think the, the biggest uh, learning that I took from that, the biggest message that I took from that is we still need a centre half. I think we still need to get, <coughs> excuse me, a, a dominant centre half. And uh, uh, again, you're no privy to what happens at Celtic on a daily basis. But for Beaton to walk in last night in front of Ayer, there's two scenarios there: that he's carrying the can for Rugby Park, no Julian, or he's in. Well, it's three scenarios: he's injured, or they don't want him to get injured because they're going to sell him. Mm -hmm. The Aaron Hickey thing, I'd have to ask Jim; he probably knows more about him. I've only ever seen him in the cup final, watch him on TV, and he's not got that level of consistency. Consistency makes you a good player. Now, again, if you go back a few years, and I said to you guys who are real Celtic fans, tell me a good game I did McGeady play. You'll always tell me the night game against AC Milan. See if you can remember First the game that came to my mind. See if you can remember the good one. They've not done enough. So, Aaron Hickey, in my opinion, for what I've seen just through TV and being at the cup final, was a game against Celtic. I've never seen him have another good game for Hearts. 
It was an interesting point that because the minute you mentioned McGeady, I thought AC Milan because that night he had us off off our seats every time we got the ball. There was a an air of expectation, um, but the the point you're making is that that means he didn't play well enough often enough, you know. And I think uh, it's, it's an excellent point when you're looking at centre halves. So obviously Shane Duffy's the guy that's been mentioned. I think everybody in this room would be pretty happy if Shane Duffy signed. It's uh, rumbling on. Are we waiting to offload a couple of players? The Irish Daily Mirror, they, they report this morning that Celtic's his preferred option. Mm-hmm. The bookies have him at 1 to 2 and 13 to 8 for him to go to West Brom, which I know you guys are the gamblers. Though, eh? So Celtic are hot favourites to sign him. And the reports were last night that him and his agent were at Celtic Park. Back to Ryan Hickey. Last he, night? Back to Ryan Hickey he, again, he, he, Paul. Um, Stevie's no he particularly he rang in what he's saying, but we take him and we start to to work with him again and get him get him he has, has been an, he's unpolished at the moment. Mm-hmm. We polish him up a wee bit more and a wee bit more because that's what that's that's what Bayern Munich's looking today. That's what he, Leon's looking today. Aston Villa, Bologna. Or Man City, they're looking, they see it, they see that in them. The potential, the, the potential, he's 18 years of age, the potential there to take that player and bring him in and teach him more about the game. You look at it, whatever Celtic pay for him, they, they don't need to pay 25% of it because they get 25% of, of the fee. So if it's a million and a half or two or whatever the figure may be, take half what you're owed. So it's a no bad investment mm-hmm. uh, for a player that these various other clubs are after. But again, consistency is what you need for players. So uh, Stevie's right what he's saying. Consistency is important in all players, young players, uh, season pros, uh, all the way through. Everybody has got to have that consistency to play at the top level. So with that 25% deal in yep. place due to the fact that he was with Celtic, it gives you a great bargaining tool if you're going toe to toe with the likes of Bologna um, or any of the other sides that are interested. Well, let, let's let, let's just say that uh, let's say he goes to Bologna and later on uh, they they get the the unpolished diamond and they polish the diamond up and later on they sell for for thirty million or twenty million or, or whatever the fee may be. I would rather be at Celtic and me sell them for twenty million. If you oh, look yeah, through the the full squad defensively. I don't think we've actually got a lot of natural defenders at the club. Oh, you're bang on, Stevie, eh? So, if you go through and you get a couple of injuries and the tens of Holy Grail, would even the people around this table feel confident that Hickey would be able to be your defensive cover as opposed to, again, somebody else you're linked with, a Barry Douglas? Mm-hmm. Would you prefer Aaron Hickey as a young man with potential coming in to cover or would you expect more comfortable with a guy like Barry Douglas? Mm-hmm. I would be more comfortable with Douglas, but then you're looking at the, the sell on value. Are you looking for that instant success of 10 in a row, or are you thinking two or three years down the line? I think um, I would definitely be, I think it's a safer bet to go for Douglas. Douglas I, would be pushing for uh, the left back spot straight off the bat. It would be in a 4 4 2 formation, but if, again, if we drop back to a 3 5 2 formation, then we don't really need to have uh, that part of the, of the conversation. But I do agree that we are weak at the back, left back. And, and possibly right back because is Frimpong the right answer there at right back as well? I, I don't I don't think so. So the defensive side of the game, we of the pool, sorry, we need to we really need to strengthen that. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Frimpong because obviously he was left out last night, Stevie, and and a player that you're a big fan of, El Hamid, comes in and he squishes it. He had a great game. He, surely he's your first choice right back. He just threw the game, and I think he showed again last night that he's just a quality player. Mm-hmm. Not first, just played. Everything just seemed to be easy, you know, passing, crossing. Again, earlier on, you brought up the late great Jock Steen, you know, and it was one full back goes, you know, and then the other one should stay back. But we got a goal in the World the European Cup final through last night. Mm-hmm. Last night, we were two full backs combined for a goal as well. You know, that that's frowned upon in football, but we were able to do it last night. I, I, I'm, I'm a massive fan of Mohammed. Oh, but yeah. you look at it. Uh, we go back to the, the team selections that we had when we had the last uh, talk together uh, on Saturday. Um, you've got you've got him in, Paul. Mm. Uh, I've got him in, and Stephen's got him in. 
So that's no that's no a bad shout. Uh, uh, for his, and he comes in there, and again he strolled it, didn't he? He looked just he looked so cool. He did, Jim. Looked How many cool. of us had beat on him? Nobody. I didn't think so. Um, another thing, again, it's not a curveball, Stevie, but we've spoken a lot about Lee Griffiths. I was fairly disappointed that he didn't make the bench. There's obviously the the chat that he's still carrying an injury. I'm now thinking the time's up for Lee. He's nowhere near the team. If the strikers all remain fit, then Lee Griffiths right now is fourth place. No. My, my concerns with Lee is that we, we need to look after him mm-hmm. because he could have a fragile mental health. But football-wise right now, nothing to do with his ability, just football-wise and being prepared to play. Neil Lennon needs to be able to depend on these guys. And for the last few while, he's not been able to depend on Neil. And if you're going into this season, it's vital. We can't have that, right, you're playing on Saturday and Lee's unavailable for something. It's out with Neil Lennon's control. Jim, what about yourself? I mean, we're big fans of Lee, Lee Griffiths. Right. Everybody in this room is a big fan of Lee Griffiths. But it is getting to that stage now, Stevie. If he's fourth choice behind the likes of Clamalla, um, then I, 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 I'm getting to that point where I think the time is up for Lee Griffiths. I, I, I would agree with you. Sorry, and Andy also had more in as well. Um, Lee Griffiths, Lee Griffiths, you need players you can depend on. Let's uh, let's not think he, he he were hearts. Let's think, let's think. Uh, try to think a wee bit more intelligent and say, if it was me putting my team out and if I could I rely on him, the answer is no. Or even at training, could I rely on that individual player? Probably not. So he wouldn't be in. He wouldn't be in my my eleven, or he wouldn't be in my squad mm-hmm. if I had a pool that size. And I'm quite sure you're the same, uh, Stephen. If if you were. If you were a coach, doesn't matter how much you like him, but if you couldn't rely on him, he wouldn't be in there. I think this season just need to be absolutely ruthless. Yeah, mm. you know. And again, people say, "Oh, you need to." You don't need to. No sentiments. It's a professional football club who's going for ten in a row, hoping to qualify for the group stages of the Champions League. You can't be sentimental this season. If they're not there, they can't do it. They don't play. Bring in somebody who's got a jersey and yeah. willing to come on and do a job. Hundred huh? percent. Yeah. Now, he's been mentioned all week, Julien. Um, you reckon perhaps one of the reasons Ayer was on the bench is maybe Neil Lennon was looking at him rather than Julien. He comes on last night and he strolls it as well. He had a fantastic game, Stevie. I'm not sure about the celebration when there's no fans to celebrate in front of, uh-huh. to be fair, but um, what a player he was last night. I mean, uh-huh. last week we're going on about him not being able to play against the likes of Lyndon Dykes and he goes on last night as a, as a cracking game. I think it's the nature of Celtic fans, which we all are. Even in a pause, the situation we'll always look for. I would see if that would have happened. We're two games into the season, like league games, you know, and we've wrote off half our team. That's just what we do. We win six one. We will look for a negative. Julian's a top class player. There's absolutely no doubt. The wee thing that I think that Celtic lack is, and I don't know if he's watched the the Man United game the other night when Fernandes goes through Lindelof because he caused the goal. Mm. I never see Celtic players having that reaction with each other. And sometimes I think it's needed. Mm-hmm. You know, Lindelof's terrible for the two goals and Fernandes slaughtered them. If somebody gives Julian and maybe a wee rocket, and again, it was really only the first half of rugby parties made two mistakes. But it wasn't a bad game. I think you're right, Paul. Uh, you, Stephen, uh, Paul, I think Steve is right. But see if somebody like uh, Duffy comes in there and helps out there as well. I think he will make Julian become a better player. I think he will. And sometimes these wee ro- eh, rollickings that eh, your captain gives you about the park is, is for your benefit to make you become better as well. So, uh, Julian, Julian last night again looked Mr. Cool. Mm-hmm. He looked Mr. Cool. But not, wasn't he really playing against much. But stay with the guys. And if the fans could encourage more as well rather than just criticise them and be negative. Two games into the season, let's relax. Relax, you play better. If they know that you're behind them a hundred percent, they 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 will all come they will all come good for us. I believe the Celtic team and squad 
will come good for everyone is this year. But the, relax. the other thing as well, Jim, is that Julian is 27 years of age. Aye. You know, Aya, who again, I'm not a particular favourite. I know that. But he's a he's a boy, you know, who Aye. can progress. Julian's 27. He should mm. be the finished article at 27. But he's no, Stevie. Should Celtic be spending £7 billion a centre and a half that's no the finished article? Uh, no, 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 really. But he's he's, le- he, he, he's, he, he's still got a long way to go in, in his game intelligence uh, when, when you watch him. But uh, I think with Duffy coming in there will we'll help them, will help him immensely this year. And, and see, this year, that's really all I'm concerned about for, for the time being, is this year to help make him and other players run about better players. But um, should we be going spending seven, eight million for players that are no a wee bit better than what we think? The answer's no. I actually think that's quite a damning indictment, Jim. You know, if you're 27 years of age and you've still got a lot to learn. These guys are playing the continent at 19 years of age. Aye. And they've played about 150 games. And we're still talking about a guy developing at 27. Ah, definitely. No. They're always developing. I, th- I think you should be the finished article at 27 of you right. if we've spent 7 million on them. Mm-hmm. On, on nights like last night, despite who we were playing, you think you think he is, and then something like the Kilmarnock game happens. Hopefully he can eradicate that, Stevie, as we move move ahead in this season, because I'm now beginning to wonder about Aya after you said maybe he's on his way out. Uh, let's see, because I think uh, a few players will be. There's a question coming in from Philadelphia, the gentleman. If you play in Cham, who do you leave out? For Saturday, going to Tannadice, personally I would leave it James Forrest. And I'm not a James Forrest hater. I just think the freshness of Ryan Christie out there, when Sham Brown and McGregor in the middle, Ellen is I think we'd take care of Dundee United comfortably. Jim, first question is, do you play him? Or are you quite happy with how we started? No, I play him. You would play him? Oh, I would play him. Yeah. I would play him. He... Forrest... Possibly, yeah. James Forrest. Forrest. Interesting. Let us know what you think via Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. And we will run through some of your comments over the next 10 minutes or so. Coming in from Facebook is um, James Downey. Forrest should not be left out of the team and will bag at least 15 goals and assist double that. Uh, most prolific winner in the SPL last season. And he was. And the goals that he's created has been astonishing. But I think based on the first three games of the season, that, that's where you're picking your team, aren't you? But there you go, there, there's, there's somebody else with a different uh, uh, opinion again. Um, you, would leave for, you would leave Forrest out and, um, and br- bring him on. Has is is Forrest really got anybody that's, that's challenging him in that position? Maybe, maybe, maybe Frimpong, maybe. But really, Stevie, I don't really think he has. So... Uh, we're leaving him out he could buck his ideas up as well to be even better and develop even more I know he's a wee bit uh, on as well but develop in his game and his mindset to become better that he doesn't get left to then it makes it a lot harder for the manager who to leave out I don't think it's a criticism sorry Jim I don't think it's a criticism of James Forrest but leaving him out the stats of the guy saying probably going to end up the most decorated Celtic player all time but we're talking about leaving Scott Brown out Mm-hmm. Most European appearance for Celtic captain through the nine in a row. We're talking about leaving him out. It's not a criticism. No, you can only start with eleven, and you've got to start with your best eleven for particular games. It can't be done. The United, maybe Ryan Christie, maybe it's no, maybe the guy's right, maybe it's James Forrest. But somebody asked, who would you leave out? And I would leave out James Forrest since mm-hmm. that Saturday. Mm-hmm. It will be interesting to see how that uh, team lines up. And, I, and I'm agreeing with my fellow pundit here. Your fellow pundit, there's <laughs> one, si- one side of the room has pundits aye, uh, and the other doesn't. Uh, Tony Cassidy, goodbye Tom Roderick, welcome Lionel Messi. Well, he would shoot the hoops to be fair and I think he probably likes playing at Celtic Park as well but um, haven't we got our own Lionel Messi coming through the ranks? Let's hope we do. Uh, Kevin Graham, do you reckon oh. any of the two Morrison and Hepburn and potentially Hickey will ever see first team football at Bayern Munich? No. I think Bayern Munich are trying to do what Manchester City have done for the last few years. Harvest kids, get them into reserves, put them out on loan and sell them for higher transfer fees. Hey. Well, if you buy Champ from Man City, you're paying four and a half million pounds. Yes. How much first team football had he played? So you're right, it's really just um, a way, it's a conveyor belt, isn't it? 
It's like an advanced in their youth system, you know, mm-hmm. their academy. Bring these guys in, they're getting first team football elsewhere, bring them in, put them through, and then you, you transfer them for more money, even if they've never seen the first team. Mm-hmm. And is it not also a, a signal for Scottish clubs, maybe virtually all Scottish clubs, give your youngsters a game? Because if you're looking at Hearts there, you're looking at Hickey, he's not, what's he played, 30 games? I th- um, think 30 games, You know, I? give them the, the game time because then he becomes a saleable asset. I mean, Scottish football for too long hasn't given youth a chance, Stevie. But you're looking at another example. Remember the, the young kid, uh, Jordan Allen, that played for Airdrie when he was an incredibly young age, 14, 15 years, years of age. He ends up going down to Wolves and Airdrie get a, a great fee for him. I think he's now at Cowden Beath, incidentally. But if you give the boys a game and he's maybe got 20 games under his belt, he comes to the attention of clubs who will take him. And even if it's 300 grand you get, that's a lot of money for some of the smaller clubs. I know they've knocked back the, the Colt idea, but what would be the, the thing? Just say for Aloha, and I'm only picking Aloha, that they became a feeder club for Celtic. Mm-hmm. And you gave them your players who were just below first team, maybe the, what would normally be the reserve league. And they stayed there for a season. You know, you've a great tie up. Allah were getting really players that they couldn't afford or normally have in their team, and then when they've played there, they're ready to move in. Yeah. Because it's too big a gap just now. And again, I believe that the Celtic fans are harder than the homegrown ones, and somebody comes in with a foreign sound in them. Mm-hmm. The thing is, as well, Stevie, that's a great point. Talking about reserve football, you played reserve football. You spoke about going and playing reserve football at Celtic Park. And as a young guy moving up, that, that's a step up. So you're learning all the time at that stage if you're playing reserve team football. You were on the same pitch as Paul McStay, am I right? Yeah. So you're playing against guys who went on to become international players. So you're going to learn far more as a, a 17, 18 year old playing against seasoned pros who are maybe out the side, getting back to fitness, out of favour than you would against another 17 year old. Absolutely, but Steve's right. The, these And, and we we'll spoke about this, that uh, these players have got to go out and get game time. Where it be, you've mentioned Dalawa there. It could be Dalawa or Cowden Beath that you have uh, spoken about there as well. I, I'm, I'm going to say this again. Celtic's got lots of friends out there with various, in, at various clubs yeah. at this particular time who would be delighted to take players, who would be delighted to take players to get them game times. Even younger players going to places like St Rocks to get, to get a bit more experience as well. Playing, playing in that uh, type of environment. Wherever you play football, if you're on that park, you're gaining experience mm-hmm. all the time. And it's all part, again, of your game intelligence and your development from within the game. I mentioned that word development again. Every player that plays a game more than the player than less is gaining more and more experience. So get them out to, to to teams that we can work with and then get them back in again. So that, it's, it's important. Mm-hmm. It really, really is important that we do it. Two or three years ago, Stephen, I know this was quite far down the line. Celtic were trying to establish a tie-in with Dunfermline Athletic and Ross MacArthur was in discussions with, with Celtic about doing that. I mean, would it be a situation where we're sending maybe six youngsters a season? And, and they would get some first team experience. I think it should because I always think, see when you get into like a league cup section, and they say we're going to play the reserves, and I always think it's really unfair on maybe the best player in the reserves that he's got to play with other reserves in a first team game. I would always like him to see play with ten of the normal first teams to see if he can adapt to the yeah. guys, and his games easier playing with better players. So if you send six or seven for Celtic, what we'll call reserves, to Dunfermline, then they go there. They're all used and it's the same level. Then Fernland are getting the benefit. You can't send one or two and they're going to play with a lower level player because they're not going to get the professionalism they need and that impetus to move on so you come back after the season you're ready to get into Celtic first team. Yeah. You know the level we're talking about? I mean, Alawa obviously, Peter Grant is uh, the manager there. Last time I checked. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chairman Mulraney. That's, that's like an ideal club to go and, and set this up. Would there be anything stopping because I know that Celtic and Dunfermline were in discussions about doing it. Would there be anything to stop a club having that tie-in? No. I think Peter's took a few. I think you would just have to see, and I'm certainly not an expert on this, 
how many loan players you can have in a season. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a limit that would maybe say five, then that would be all you could have. Mm -hmm. I don't think they would allow you to have 11 Celtic players going to play for Aloha. You know, there'd obviously be implications in something like that. Aye, the limit for each club, Stephen. Aye, aye. You know, but I, th- I think it would be a good idea. I think we could do well for our young players rather than try to go for a development league right into the first team. That's actually a good question. I'm thinking here. Mm-hmm. That's a good question. How many can go for the one club? I'm not. I'm not sure on that. I need to check that. But that that that's quite a good question. A uh, another wee bit that I've spoke to somebody yesterday when we were speaking last week about uh, the outstanding fixtures and how it could affect us. Mm-hmm. I think talks have taken place, although they've not been confirmed, that they would be played during about the international weekend in September. Is that right? Yep. Which which is ideal, isn't it? Is that early September? I think it's towards the end. Right. Interesting, and we'll keep an eye on that. Now, there was a discussion just the other day there, Stevie, in relation to some comments that had been made, and it just shows you how there is a narrative. So if someone says something, let's... Let's put a spin on it. Let's put a headline on it. Um, and you had a, a comment to make in relation to Charlie Adam, but you've gone away and thought about that and you feel that you'd maybe been led down the garden path with the headline. Yep, uh, I watched it again. Again, it was him and Tam McManus and Tam McManus is still really saying the same narrative. But I understand Tam McManus. I know Tam McManus' dad and he's a, a lovely, lovely man, big Celtic fan and a great supporter of the candy. But what surprised me with him, they were talking about grounds they had played at. And Charlie Adam was talking about Old Trafford, the Bernabeu. And Tom, Tom McManus said, I played at Ibrox and Parkhead. And I thought, as a Celtic fan, you would never put them in that order. No. You know, if somebody says, you both Celtic Rangers, Parkhead, Ibrox. And I thought, that's a really strange something who's brought in the Celtic tradition. But I went on to Charlie Adam and he, he was speaking. And again, it was about the a Yeti deal. He was very, very complimentary towards Celtic and the fantastic job that Peter Law and the coaching team and the manager has done. I think the bit when he says he'd heard he wasn't up to it, I took it he was talking about his fitness because he says in a few years' time this guy will be worth 10 to 15 million quid if he develops the same way because Celtic have a brilliant model. So I think maybe I jumped the gun and probably done it wrong, but he actually came across as a very rounded young man. Uh, and again... I think earlier in his career, maybe it was a wee bit different, but obviously suffered the the death of his father for completing suicide in 2012, which was a horror occasion for him and his family. So he'll probably never listen to this, but if I was a wee bit harsh, I really apologise to him because even to speak the way he does now after all that time, I think it's testament to him and his father's upbringing for him. I think that's brilliant that you've come out and, and suggested that. And if you're wrong, you say you're wrong. So brilliant, Stephen. Well done. Absolutely. Is that no great testament to Stephen? Uh, coming out there, coming saying, uh, I've went back, I've had a look at it, had a wee think about it. I've made I've made a mistake here. Mm-hmm. So good on you. I'm proud of you. Well that's done. brilliant. Well done. A couple of more points before we finish up for today's Axon Bulletin. Kevin Graham, who's well known to the Celtic State Minds listeners, no one has been poor enough to get dropped for Encham. Until that happens, or a change in formation, then he's a sub. Well, there's, there's Kevin come in uh, with a wee, a wee one there. But um, just like the the horse with a hat on it, I don't uh, necessarily agree with that. You don't need to have a bad game to make changes. But you had a change last night. Correct. Christopher Iyer dropped it. Frimpong dropped it. Mm-hmm. So there's changes that the manager's decided. Yeah. That, that, I be- that he, he's the only guy that makes a decision. Everybody has an opinion. Our, our opinion was something different for Kevin's. Aye. But two players last night dropped out. So is Kevin going to go back to Neil Lennon and go, by the way, you go to Rang in the back of 6 nothing victory? No, but he can't. Wouldn't he think he, so? No, he can't, Stevie. And what, what we're saying that here is, Paul, that you, you don't have bad games or good. You, you change your team to, to suit how you want to play on on the night or or on the day, you just make changes mm-hmm. for for the formation. You make changes to to adapt. Not because somebody's not playing well. That's uh, I don't agree with that at all. Nobody gets dropped because they're just not playing well. There's various reasons for for changing your team, and a lot a lot of different things come in here. Did any see the the brilliant guy on RTE last night talking about the Leipzig? No, I didn't actually. PSG game, a guy called Richie Sadlier. 
and he slaughtered both of them and says how everybody in football hates them. And he's an outstanding journalist, you know, to say it. Like Sig, he says, they're just a promotional thing. He says, they're like an advert on a billboard. And PSG, they're ran by a country who just terrible civil rights and homophobia and it. Tom English, oh, we criticise teams like that, we would be attacked by their fans. So there's a different level of journalism. But the best one for today, guys, Joe Biden, who's running for president of the USA, his code name for the Secret Service is Celtic. Yes. <laughs> You're kidding. No. <laughs> but I need, to, I, need to, I need to come in here with my colleague, my, 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 my co-pundit, so to speak. He's, he's actually got another name. He's actually got another name as well. He's now known as the Roy Keane of the Celtic State of Mind Broadcasting. Is that being commented on? And I actually think he thinks he's Roy Keane now. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's actually he's actually sitting there going, I'm quite chuffed with myself with some of these wee comments I'm putting out because it's going to go over Europe. Yeah, but you've got a fan base uh, all over the place. Uh, and as, as does a Celtic State of Mind because they've been commenting throughout this bulletin as they always do. So thank you each and every one of you to, for tuning in. Please get yourself subscribing on YouTube. Uh, we will be producing daily content uh, for everything Celtic, everything, every point of discussion. Uh, and you can keep us right from home as well. So thank you all for joining us. But all that's left for me to say is thank you to Stevie Mullen and once again Jim Simonetti for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.